welcome to this week's Rough Cut. Um, we've got a couple of seats down here. People are uh, people have not found a place to sit. Uh, this week, we're very happy to have uh, Professor Dr. Maury Rolette here as our speaker this week. Um, he is a professor of systems ecology at University of Montana. He is also director of the University of Montana Office of the Institute on Ecosystems, the director of the Systems Ecology Intercollegiate Graduate Program, and the associate director for the Center for Integrated Research on the Environment. Uh, it's a wonder he gets any research done. Um, he uh, got his PhD from Arizona State and a master's from University of Montana. Uh, he's Montana born and bred. Um, he started his career at University of New Mexico, uh, went on to Virginia Tech, and then moved to the Flathead uh, Biological Research Station, and then from there down to Missoula. Uh, he does research on riverscape ecology with a particular focus on how humans affect riverscapes and on potential for restoration. Um, so with that, I will turn it over. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, everybody, for having me. Now, in talking with Kathy about rough cut seminars, it's my understanding that they're supposed to be atypical in some sense. Like interruptions are, are requested and welcome. <laughs> <Eggs>. However, <laughs> eggs, tomatoes, however, well, <laughs> That'll go both ways. He's got to ask these guys up front how they feel about it. Uh, however, interrupting me is not done by a tenant. So you got to interject. you got to project. Say, hey. And, I'm ha and I think that would be good. Right? Um, I thought Rich's introduction was interesting because, you know, there was all this administration stuff. And I realized that I have, well, okay, let's, let's look at it this way. In one context, I'm old. <laughs> there, there are data that suggest this is true. For instance, discussions with undergraduates suggest I'm old. <laughs> There's photographic evidence that suggests <laughs> I'm old and that I'm not nearly as good looking as I think I am. <laughs> and so if you think about this from an academic life cycle, you got 40 years of an active career before you retire. That puts me in the third quarter looking right at the fourth quarter, right? And I have accepted some administration roles because I kind of like the, the being able to manifest um, potential, res uh, distribute resources to people that can really earn them. And so at some point, you kind of sit back and start thinking about your career and, you know, what have you been pursuing? So that brings us sort of to the idea of um, advancing the slide. Work when we were in warm-up. Okay. So that brings us to Donald Stokes ideas about what he calls past years of quadrant. Where these two axes are, you know, how brilliant is the idea? How much does it push forward the thinking in a field of science? As compared to down here, where you know how useful is the work really? And I think many of us start up here in Bohr's quadrant, where you're driven by ideas. The, the questions should be relevant, they should contribute to your field, they should Contribute to theory. And, and this is what Borg Molly Adams certainly did. He was the first to propose the quantum relationships that deal with atomic structure. You know the model of the atom where you see those orbits going around it. It's the most popular version of the model of the atom. It's inaccurate in many ways, not very applicable in many ways, but it was a, a brilliant push forward. As compared to Edison's quadrant down here, his invention of the light bulb really did very little for the understanding of electromagnetism. But I think you could argue that it has some applicability, right? <laughs> I mean, it has some good applied science. So you're supposed to be, in some ways, the argument that still makes is that you should be targeting past years. The understanding of distinction between spontaneous generation, character of life, pasteurization as a process, the spontaneous. Last, all those things are brilliant combinations of advancing theory and having a great deal of applicability. My concern, of course, is that I'm down here. <laughs> <laughs> so really, you know, when you're early in the game, you want to get those good quality pubs, and you, and you get hired, maybe you get tenure, and then think, I wonder if anybody read anything I wrote, or <laughs> what, you know, where are you from, what do you care about, and maybe you might move over into some applied science. So I'm going to give a presentation here, which is a kind of a combination of the two. I'm still very interested in the theories in ecology and how they, we might use streams and rivers to understand them. But I'm clearly also a Montana, and I'm thrilled to get to be back here and 
finish my career here. And so I'm interested in the landscape and what my work might do to help with the quality and character of those resources. And that's it. We're going to focus on the Clark Fork River. It is by far the largest river in Montana when it leaves the state. Its flow is substantially greater than the Missouri when it leaves in the east. It, it drains the west slope of the divide and from its origin, we'll talk a great deal about to the point where it gets down near Idaho, it's a class one river throughout. Rafting and fisheries, huge role for tourism in, in Montana and a huge role for that river system. The upper Clark Fork is that portion of the river system that originates where the Blackfoot joins the um, Clark Fork just upstream from Missoula. So this is the upper Clark Fork River Basin. There's a couple of famous communities here, Anaconda and Butte, that we'll talk about. And out of those communities come two small creeks, Silver Bow and Warm Spring. And when they join, that's the beginning of the Clark Fork. So the Clark Fork flows some 200 kilometers to its confluence with the Blackfoot. When the Blackfoot enters, it doubles in size, it changes its chemistry, it's a whole different fisheries, it's a whole different beast. The upper Clark Fork's got extraordinary environmental and social legacies that are relevant to its character. These guys were called the Copper Kings. There's a book uh, called The War of the Copper Kings. I don't believe it's particularly well written, but it is a very good overview of some ridiculous behavior by millionaires. These guys got to the point where they would make business decisions that cost them money as long as it screwed the other guy. And the whole process was to derive from the earth and what they called the richest hill on earth, um, first silver, but then copper. At the turn of the century, there was 100,000 people in view, far bigger than Denver was at that time. And during the time of the First World War, that, that mine complex provided over 50% of the nation's copper. So as you can see from the structure of these um, facilities, there's no environmental regulations going on here. The tailings were just spewed about on the floodplains and held in piles. Um, the book, um, War of the Copper, Copper Kings, indicates that for a 70 mile radius from Butte, there was no live vegetation. In the afternoon, they had to turn on the street lights because the smog from the stack would settle down into the community up on the hill and make it dark enough that they would have muggings in the afternoon. So they had to fire up the street lights. And these are the environments in which all of these workers um, lived and, and worked. The primary reason for death among the workers, contrary to the idea of them being buried down in the shaft, was freezing to death. Because they would come out of the earth to the sub-zero temperatures of Butte and die on the way home. So we have an environmental condition that propagates to the rest of the river system as a result of the 1908 flood. Flood of record, enormous. Here's the Higgins Street Bridge in Missoula. If any of you've been to Missoula, the Tamarack Brewery is right down there. And you can see that the flood system inundates the, the entire drainage, pushes the mine tailings all the way to Lake Pend Oreille, distributes them broadly across the floodplain, A grades the flood, floodplain by as much as a meter. And as late as the 70s and 80s, the river would run red under high flow conditions, inundating these sediments and tailings that have extraordinary reducing power, mobilizing metals, massive fish kills. Many of the farmers with which we work for land access remember these things quite clearly. The mine was owned by ARCO, that ends up being BP. Years of uh, litigation result in um, agreements between the Department of Justice of the state of Montana and the federal, uh, uh, through the federal government, EPA, to have uh, BP and ARCO pay for re remediation and restoration. There are four Superfund sites involved here. One is down here uh, the, uh, near Missoula, the Milltown Dam collected contaminated sediment. There was an arsenic issue there. Uh, Anaconda is one. The Butte Hill is a, a third. And then in the flatlands of Butte, there's a, like a creosote pole factory that has its own Wounds. So the four of them together make what's called a mega fund site. It's the largest one in the nation. One of those super fund sites is called the Upper Clark Fork Operable Unit, the OU. 
broken into three reaches, reaches A, B, and C. Most of what we're going to talk about relevant to our research program is in reach A and C. A is going to be fully restored. Very little going on in B. Its environmental conditions suggest maybe it's best to leave it as it is. C I'll talk more about in a bit. So my lab is basically focusing on what the long-term consequences of remediation and restoration are for the ecosystems, communities, and populations in Clark Fork River. Let's talk a little bit about what we know about the Clark Fork to start with. There are three great data sets that we can draw from to understand something about the past and how it's poised currently. One of those is generated by Johnny Moore and Heiko Longer from U of M. Johnny just recently retired. He's a professor emeritus now. He sampled three sites. Here I've numbered the sites one through six. Each one of the yellow triangles represents one of these long-term monitoring points. Each red square is a USGS gauge. The, uh, the sites are a subset of a large number of sites that was distributed from the headwaters in Butte all the way to Lake Ponderay and beyond. Johnny's uh, program uh, routinely, about every two months, sampled the sediment recoverable, total recoverable metals in the sediments at sites two, four, and six. And then on a number of occasions listed here, including one in um, 2014, they did a 23-site longitudinal survey of the metal content in the sediments. This data set is uh, from what was called the Voluntary Nutrient Reduction Program. So the state, as a rider on a state bill, the Tri-State Water Quality Council derived enough money to create a set of monitoring sites, a large number that I mentioned earlier that extend from the headwaters all the way past Lake Ponderette. At the same time, they asked most identifiable point sources to voluntarily reduce their outputs to the river system. And there's an excellent uh, data set that goes with this. The money runs out in 2007. The Department of Environmental Quality picks up some of the sites, only four or five of them, and only samples them in the summer. But they're still ongoing. At the same time, the VNRP funded the long-term periphyton, that's the algae that grows on the rocks in the river system. So we have a good summertime uh, record of the uh, primary producers in the river system as well. So let's, let's go through what we know before we get to uh, some questions about how the system works and may change in the future. Here's a plot uh, from Johnny Moore's data set. He gave me all of his samples and all of his data, and I uh, offer those to any of you in the room who uh, Think they might have something novel they want to measure on these same sediment samples. Uh, so here I've replotted the data showing um, as we go upstream to downstream the copper concentrations in the sediment. A couple of things to note. Upstream environments, we have an intercept back in 1990, somewhere up around 1,500 parts per million. Copper is by far the biggest insult to the system. Arsenic second, zinc third, lead and cadmium fourth and fifth. As you move down gradient then from reach A to reach B, you can see that that concentration drops. So there's a longitudinal distribution logically associated with the source of being upstream. The other thing you can see is a significant exponential decline in the concentrations. These curves are exponential fits used by uh, more and longer to predict future conditions, and there are significant temporal declines. So this looks really good in the sense that you can see the river um, what more and longer said, healing itself. Except when you look at the relevant concentrations. This is called the probable effects concentration, the concentration above which you're likely to see some detrimental impact to aquatic life. And this is the one below which you should be okay. So you can see that we're nowhere near that. Even here, if you project this as they did in their EST paper. It'll take hundreds of years to get down to here. So through the geomorphic processes of bringing in sediment, transporting them, under the hydrologic conditions that have existed for the last 50 years, it'll take a couple centuries to clean itself up. Same stories for the other metals. Cadmium and lead are down in this zone now, so they're clearly not as, um, as bad as the copper or arsenic. Arsenic's a little more interesting, frankly, it has a redox 
activity and mimics phosphorus in many ways. Um, and there's, a, there's an untold story for arsenic that I won't go into much today. What else do we know? We know that the river is full of cladophora. Cladophora is a filamentous green algae. It is prolific under nutrient-rich conditions. It can explode and dominate in a monotypic and it's just a mass of green algae to the point where you can walk, I mean, walk across it. This picture is 300 milligrams per square meter of chlorophyll A. You basically extract the pigment from the algae, use it as a measure of abundance. Um, some folks from the DEQ, a Mike and colleagues, mm. set 100 milligrams per meter squared as the water quality standard. Based on a survey of pictures, here's one of the pictures they would show the public, and so the public decided 100 milligrams per square meter looks okay, which I think itself is an intriguing process, but we've talked about that another time. And you can also see that it violates the water quality standards throughout the upper Clark Fork. It's, it's never really below it. And from these air bars, you might imagine there are a number of 600 and 700 milligrams per meter samples in there. So this thing is full of algae. Which then makes um, ecosystem ecologists like me think, well, you can only grow algae like that if you have a lot of nutrients available. So when we look at the nutrient data set, a couple of things come uh, are evident right away. There are gaps in here, and it's a really a crying shame, especially since I started applying for funds right about here, there's going to be another gap right here. <laughs> Who knows how long, how long it's going to be? Um, but the other thing is that these were bi weekly samples throughout this early duration. And then here's the period of time right in here for the voluntary nutrient reduction program. So the red bars here are the mean concentrations for nitrate on a seasonal basis. This is the most upstream site, one, and this is the most downstream site, six. So the thing that should jump out right away is that in terms of the concentration of nitrate, these red bars are pretty similar to those. Somewhere about 0.3 milligrams per liter or 300 parts per billion in both of these environments. The difference is that the discharge plotted here in black with the black <coughs> dots goes up pretty much in order of magnitude. So to maintain those same concentrations, there's going to be a lot more nitrogen in the system because there's a lot more water. The other thing that be, should uh, be somewhat evident is that there's a seasonality here. All of the highest nitrate concentrations occur during the winter, and then the lowest nitrate concentrations happen during the summer. The winter numbers are, are, are intriguing, and we'll come back to those. I think terrestrial ecologists would say, well, of course, you got more nitrate in the river in the winter because the terrestrial system's turned off, and the nitrate flows into the river. That kind of works, and it kind of doesn't. And so we'll return to that. Um, phosphate. Uh, or, uh, yeah, uh, soluble reactive phosphorus in the form of phosphate, shown here in the white dots, are uh, white squares, are far, it's far less abundant than nitrate is in most seasons. But you can see in the summertime, sometimes there's more SRP in the water than there is nitrate. Now, there's virtually no ammonia. That's the other form of inorganic nitrogen that's really sort of plant available. And I, we have the data on the total, nitrogen total phosphorus, but if you want to talk about that, we, should, we can do that at a, another time. What they, these data do suggest, though, when you look closer at them, is that there's a boatload of phosphate in the park fork. These numbers in micrograms per liter, 20 to 45, that's an enormous amount of phosphate. Phosphate limitation is down around three or two or something like that. So that when you put these together, and figure out the ratio of the atoms, the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio is less than five. There's only one site where it's appreciably above the red field ratio, suggesting that there isn't enough phosphorus to grow algae. So <coughs> if the algae stops growing, it's because it runs out of nitrogen, even though the nitrogen is relatively abundant. But I do want to point out, for those of you who don't work with nitrogen, while I think of this as a lot of nitrogen, if you were from Wisconsin, this would be almost nothing. I mean, they have orders of magnitude more. The drinking water standard is 10 milligrams per liter. And we're talking about 0.3. So, but it's relevant to the landscape you're in. And the response of the system is responding to the increase in availability compared to its historical conditions. We got lots of, we got lots of um, 
of nutrients in the system, and they change spatially as you move down the, uh, the system. So here I plotted the load of SRP. So that's basically you're standing on the bank, and you're keeping track of how much mass goes by that location every month. And plotted it for the six sites and their distance downstream from the origin of the uh, watershed. And what you can see for all the different seasons is that more phosphorus goes down, uh, accumulates in the system as you move downstream. The largest loads occur in the spring, you can see here, and all of these axes are the same. Three megagrams per month, and there's a pretty continuous climb. Th this is fairly typical because phosphorus is associated with particles. When you get spring flow, there's flooding, particles are mobilized, they can, they can sorb and desorb. So we expect to see that behavior in the spring. When we look at the nitrogen numbers for nitrate, we see a different picture. The first thing to note is that the vast majority of loading that occurs annually occurs in the winter. And you can see that that scale for the winter and spring are very different than for the summer and fall. Far less nitrogen moving down the system during summer and fall. And during those periods, there are sections of the river where the mass declines. Now, if we look at the, the flow of water, even during these two periods, summer and fall, water accumulates. So it's not like the, the mass is going down because the river is going underground. There's something else going on. And you can see from these block uh, segments of the river system that there are reaches of the river that appear to be consuming nitrogen, even in the face of um, upstream availability. <clears throat> the other thing to note, which is really interesting, is this piece right here, as you go from one to two, and you could calculate what percentage of the total load comes in right there. And you can see from this plot that it's an enormous amount. Okay, so here are the five sub-reaches that occur in between the sites, like the spaces between the lines, right? Well, you could calculate using a mass balance approach, that which a mass which comes in and that which goes out. If the numbers are positive, then you're accumulating nitrogen. If they're negative, the argument is that it's being taken up. And here we segregated it seasonally. And using that inclusive pronoun. I want to point out that pretty much everything I'm talking about today comes from the, the brains and efforts of the team of people who work with me, primarily from Mark Papak, who has done a huge amount of work on this. I want to acknowledge that right away. So you can see, it loads a bunch of nitrogen in this section, and then consumes some of it here, and then bounces along in here. And look at the phosphorus now. This is a reach that phosphorus just pours in, and it coincides with sedimentary phosphorus. Um, I think I skipped right over that picture of the phosphate exit, didn't I? Let me go back to this. There's an exit right upstream from where we work, and the exit's called phosphate. The phosphate mine there. So this is geologically derived phosphorus, and you can think of the landscape as really heat rich. We did work on 10 different rivers distributed across Montana, and nine of them are full of phosphorus. Be interesting to look at, I hadn't done this at a really large scale, but it seems like there's a lot of pea rich rivers in Montana. <laughs> okay, so this means we've got a river system that is, like all river systems, influenced by its surroundings, but also to some degree carrying out its own processes internally that are changing the environment. All right, so after all of that litigation and collecting these data and some idea of what's going on, they come to a settlement in the early 2000s and decide things are going to be first remediated. That means you get rid of the health risk, and then second, restored. Now, depending upon with whom you are speaking, that can mean something very different. Um, one of the major expenditures for restoration money were parks. So... Alternative endpoints are part of restoration, but a big chunk of money is going into reconstructing the riverine fluvial systems that used to be here. Here's the picture of what is now called Two River State Park, where the Blackfoot comes in to the Clark Fork, and the Milltown Dam used to be right there. This is a big project creating, and that's a beautiful sine wave Rosman Riffle unit. I don't know what it is. 
I mean, it's a it's a very controversial process, and there are there are there are what's the right word? There are economic procedures that the state employs for restoration, and they hire people to do it. It's a business. It's called ecological restoration. That's different than restoration ecology. Because those are different things. Um, here's an example of the sort of restoration that's going on in the, in the upper portions of the Clark Fork. All of Reach A, from the origin of the river down Garrison Junction, about 80 river kilometers is undergoing restoration. That will occur over the time period from about 2013 to 2022. Um, it will include removing the tailings, bringing in new soils, and revegetating the floodplain. And I'll say more about what that is in a minute. <clears throat> But in getting involved with this, we've met the operators, the guys from the DEQ who are running the field operations, and their operators that are running these excavators are now good enough that they can look at the material in the bucket and say, that's still crapped up, we need to go deeper. Or they can say, this is good soil. Because there's enough metal that it shines and you can see it. So there really is an extraordinary amount of learning and dedication that's going into this. It's really encouraging. So with these sort of restoration settings, um, the opportunity exists at a large scale to ask some really interesting questions. At the same time, the, while the metals represent a core remediation restoration issue, we also know there are nutrient issues, and, and the, the state is aware of this. So they negotiated funds that helped Butte just the other day bring their new $34 million wastewater treatment plant fully online. Now this is a picture of four white males cutting a string of toilet paper instead of a ribbon, which I thought was pretty insightful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and it's interesting how white and male they are, but each one of these guys has dedicated a huge part of their career to make this happen. It was a real battle. You didn't have $34 million. But they were arguing that their condition in their water that they have to treat is not just the result of their community, but of the mining legacy. We'll come back to that. <clears throat> so the questions we're asking is, how do these things combine to uh, give us an opportunity to ask questions about how rivers work as ecosystems, understand how ecosystems work, and then also um, get involved with the state and some of their concerns about the river system as a habitat for fisheries, specifically for trout, and its economic implications. So I want to go through some of the ideas we've developed here in the context of the theory of uh, the way rivers work and how restoration might help us learn about rivers, and then finish on a story about um, Reach C and the fisheries that exist there, which puts us in, hopefully, those two quadrants, quadra. but based upon our success, the lower left, we have obliterated the lower left one all together, so it can fall in there. <laughs> but it depends, you know, it depends on how you measure that. The funding success for this would put me squarely in the third quadrant, <laughs> and I'll take my co-PIs with me. <laughs> uh, so, back to the restoration idea. Here's what they call phases, and they don't mean phases by temporal phases, they mean chunks of the river that they're going to restore. And you might think that they do it, take out the upstream sources first, so the downstream environments benefit from upstream efforts. But they're really concerned about what they call unraveling. The perspective is that they need to create these river channels. And associated with them are these burlap tow slope structures that are going to keep the channel in place. They want to maintain geomorphic continuity long enough for the vegetation to take hold and begin to provide some feedback. So they lock it in, and there's a big argument about whether or not that's a good idea or not. On this particular phase, this is phase one, they don't want all of the contiguous phase, they don't want all the phases to be contiguous because then you propagate unraveling. So they're jumping up and down in different sections of reach A for restoration. What you can see in this plot, these piles here on the left are the tailings. This operation over here is the one that's processing the new soils, that I'll talk about in a minute, that end up back in here. And, and, and they do these, these are probably, they do it in miles, so three, four mile segments, so 10 kilometer chunks. And there's something like 
15 phases or something. The restoration process has to deal with that. That's called a slicken. It's a terrestrial environment, floodplain environment, where the metal divide, the, uh, deposition is so great that the, the sediments are slick and nothing grows. So those are all being excavated and take away, uh, taken away. The revegetation occurs on what they call vegetative backfill. So we have gone up to their soil or zoom. What this is is a, a terrace some distance from the park floor. They dig nine bucketfuls of this huge excavator, dump it in a dump, dump truck, and then take one bucketful of that mulch, dump it in the same dump truck, and then that becomes a soil. And that mulch is you know, some cedar, cypress, who knows what. And if you want to know more about it, you can ask Jules, because she's doing the organic geochemistry on it. It's, you know, you know how it's, what mulch smells like. So this is the soil, it goes back into the flood plan, then they revegetate it with various exclosures to keep beaver and ungulates out, and all the risk that goes with massive revegetation that might then be followed by drought and the public looks out there and you got a bunch of dead plants. <laughs> so it's no minor effort, and you know it's easy to criticize them. Well, why are you doing that? Which academics have done. After they got done with that restoration of Mill Town. One of my colleagues from the University of Montana wrote a scathing paper on why they did that completely wrong. With no communication with the state about that beforehand, with no recognition of what they have to try to accomplish. So there really is a unique mixing of cultures that we're trying to pull off here. One of the things that you'll find in the reaches that haven't been restored is this sort of look. This is my colleague, Mark, standing approximately five or six feet above the Clark Fork at base flow. It's in trench, and the river cannot possibly interact with its floodplain, even if you get a, a, a fairly major flood. So a big focus on the restoration is to allow rivers to again interact with their floodplain. And that's ultimately what you want river systems to be able to do, because the flood pulse is a major part of the way river systems work, especially those that exist in landscapes snow melt driven, like ours. The Northwest, the Montane Rockies have a flood pulse and it's a major organizer. The philosophical or theoretical construct behind the flood pulse was developed by Young and Bailey and Sparks back in the late 80s and early 90s with the idea that if you're up in the headwaters and you have a flood, those floods typically cause mass mortality restructure resources, open space, and initiate succession, a classic disturbance perspective. But if you move down the system enough, flood, floods are regularly occurring events that don't generate mass mortality. Instead, they cause this pulse of productivity. So it's gone from some sort of disturbance to some sort of subsidy. And the model they use is essentially a moving aquatic terrestrial interface. It starts as terrestrial under low flow. It begins to move a littoral or a shoreline zone up into the terrestrial environment so that at maximum standing stock of water, maximum pool, these are critical nurseries for fishes. And there's an extraordinary amount of productivity akin to estuaries or, or wetlands. Then the floodplain, or rather the flood pulse recedes, the terrestrial environment becomes a source of materials for the water, feeding metabolic and biogeochemical processes. And our large river systems, which have been dammed and canalized and diverted, have lost that flood pulse. And in many ways, that's influenced the way the rivers process materials and the way floods themselves are propagated to downstream environments like New Orleans. So we thought that this opportunity to reconnect the floodplain was an opportunity to think about the flood pulse and the role it may play in the way rivers work. And so this team of investigators, some of whom are in the room here, um, including uh, Juliana and Rob, along with Mark, my uh, postdoc, Mark Papak, and then Mike DeGrandre. And Mike is an interesting individual. He's actually like a chemist, but I don't hold it against him. He also goes out on ocean ships and stuff. He makes these sensors that one was called the X Prize. They're basically really, really small spectrophotometers that can measure dissolved gases like CO2 or oxygen, or he also has one for 
pH. And they're distributed around the world's oceans to address acidification in the world's oceans. So it gives us an opportunity to track the behavior of the river using both CO2 and O2, and Rob's skill sets to put them together to understand the metabolism. So we've been trying to go after questions about the flood pulse. And here's our basic, here's our sort of organizing question. How will the restored floodplain connectivity interact with the fact that metals and nutrients are going to change? to organize these river uh, ecosystem properties over the coming decades. We do this based upon the idea that there should be a predictable behavior by a river like the Clark Fork over an annual time cycle that re reflects the flood pulse. So the blue line here is the average Clark Fork discharge for a 30 year period. And we recognize a period of the flood pulse, a period of base flow, and then the winter period. Now, if you go into the uh, literature and look at what's been done on the Clark Fork in the winter, there's some extraordinarily interesting stuff that has to do with ice cover and its influence on groundwater and surface water interaction, all sorts of stuff. But it's pretty abiotic. I mean, it's damn cold, as you all know. Um, and we're, we're basically not going to spend a great deal of time pursuing that window. So let's compare these two. Under a flood pulse condition, we're arguing that the behavior of the ecosystem is it, is controlled by exogenous forces. That is, the resources that come from outside of the system, donated by the floodplain. The lockedness materials are those that enter the system from somewhere else, and they ought to drive a bunch of heterotrophy, rich carbon usable external sources of food, so that if you look at the ratio of in-stream primary productivity to total ecosystem respiration, you expect that to be less than one. It's a heterotrophic ecosystem. It settles down into a well-defined channel that's well lit, and we know from those big green mats that it can grow and create a lot of organic matter. We would argue then that the feed R ratio would be greater than one. Net ecosystem productivity would be positive. There would either be biomass accrual or export from the system. And if it is driven by internal dynamics, we would expect the primary production and the respiration it supports to be highly correlated. So this is the idea of cycling from a period of time where exogenous forces are important to a period of time when the endogenous forces are important. So with that, we propose to think of restoration as an external force that changes the, the system's regime. And if we borrow the term regime from the literature, uh, a regime reflects the characteristic behavior of a system maintained by processes and feedbacks. So we propose what we call a functional regime. This is a predictable sequence of both ecological, material, and energetic behavior. We think there will be a regime in which the river functions differently in terms of its energy flow and its influence on materials in the future than the regime it's in now. And in order to address regimes appropriately, you've got to step back into the literature. Now, that idea of a regime is tied to the notion of a regime shift, that something exogenous flips a system from one set of conditions to another. And there is a big literature on this. It comes from uh, social ecological systems, um, and Kenzie's work, and uh, C.S. Hollings, Steve Carpenter, the idea that Something dynamic is flipping you out of one state and into another. It includes the requirement that you can show nonlinear dynamics, that there are threshold behaviors, and that there are feedbacks relevant to maintain those different states. The idea of a regime shift. But we didn't really want to say that. But the term regime was the right one. So maybe we'll get lucky. And we can use some of these methods. Anderson's paper here gives you a number of methods by which you can argue that a regime shift happens. Here's the software packages, the methods. We have some good long-term data sets. Bob's with this. Mark's really good with stats. Maybe we'll be able to figure this out. But what we really want to know is whether or not the ecological system is really going to change in character. So this is our conceptual, or this is our, our hypothesis. We think the combination of restoration and nutrient reduction will change these functional regimes because, for one thing, there will be local effects that will reestablish connectivity 
change the nutrient regimes, change the metal regimes, and those connections should have all the time. So we we think the reestablishing those connections in the headwaters should change that regime locally. And that's over, 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 over some period of time. But we also think that that regime change driven by restoration should alter longitudinal gradients. Rivers are notoriously organized from upstream to downstream. Some of the most fundamental conceptual models do that. So here we have the model that shows the, the oscillation from um, a condition where heavily influenced by locked in the endogenous phase, not able to come out of it, it progresses to a phase where these things are more balanced. And we're arguing that this is driven by restoration, that this regime change is a result of that effort. We also think there'll be longitudinal changes, but we really don't know a lot about how these things are going to change. We use the methods that um, Moore and Longer use here, to propose changes in the metals, and we can see that restoration should drop copper in the headwater reaches. We don't know what's going to happen to the nitrogen, so we can't really predict the upstream downstream conditions. In the long run, we're trying to get resources from Eltred to be able to keep up the restoration monitoring and ask some of these questions. Eltred is a tricky beast because well, I know there are people in the room who know this. You have to propose a full-scale proposal, and the amount of money really can't possibly support it. So it's a tricky beast. Let me just finish here with a short story about the uh, Reach Sea. So the Clark Fork is one of those rivers, and you guys live over in the same environment, I think Gallatin and, and all these beautiful rivers are iconic rivers. When I worked at Virginia Tech, they uh, – People would always ask me when they found out I was from Montana, I said, oh, you must fly through those rivers. I'm like, no, but I do play golf near them. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm, I'm starting to learn how to fly fish. It's not easy. I don't know how to tie all the work. And when you look at these rivers, you know, there are there are other rivers near the Clark Fork that are classic, like the Blackfoot and the Bitterroot. And the state has data on the fish, about 620 fish per kilometer in the Bitterroot, not quite as many in the Blackfoot. And if you jump over the divide here into the big hole, the numbers go way up. The big hole is full of fish, almost 2,000 per kilometer. I got some ideas as to why that is. And one of the um, last remaining grayling populations in the 48 states there. And then that flows into the headwaters of the Missouri River systems you guys are likely are, uh, aware of. The Missouri then flows through a series of impoundments. And there's a ripple right by Craig. They call it the Seven Mile Riffle. It has 3,000 fish per kilometer, and people from around the world come to float that riffle and catch, catch them on this fish. One of my students is a guide. I met him on the big hole. He was a guide, and now he's working with me. And he said, whenever they fish it, they have, they use fish so they make sure they don't get any or hooks, so they make sure there's no fish smaller than 18 inches. I've never caught an 18 fish. <laughs> So here are the data from Pat Sample, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks for the Clark Park. There's the bitter root and the big hole. And if we eliminate the 1980s data, there are the data. And look at Reach C. There's no fish in Reach C. And this is of concern for a bunch of different agencies. So we have some money to look at why Reach C is suffering the way it is. And here we have our layout for Reach C. We got locations within the reach that we're looking at stuff. We got locations in the um, nearby trips. The idea is, is there a bottom-up issue? Is there something about nutrients and algae and food that aren't getting their fish? And that really is the case. If you look at the benthic organic matter distribution in, these, in this river, it's just a gigantic amount. Here's, here's reach C, and here's the reaches above and below it. Here's a couple reference. Oh, that's sort of basic model of what it looks like as you go through it. And here's a reference system for the four other river systems. We've only got about six, and this is up to 100, and it's a carpet of green stuff. And it translates to these giant coarse particulate loads that, in the that are in the water column. And you can see it just grow as you go through reach sea, and it's gone when you get down here. So we wanted to know, if, well, maybe is this drift issue 
specific to each C or does it exist in A and B? So we extended the sampling. And here I've got a plot from um, racetrack, which is here. And with it, I don't know if you can see it, but you'll see trout swim in down there. <coughs> Clearly it's green. But the low true A and B that are suspended in the water column are nothing like those in C. And look at what's coming at you. See, it's like a, you know, driving a, a, a Land Rover through a jungle with all the bushes. I, I mean, I don't know how well fish would do as sight predators under those environments. Is that, is that really relevant? You don't really know. So we're basically trying to figure out what this algae is doing. One of the things we're trying to address is what about the benthic environment itself? That's where the bugs live. So we put these oxygen <clears throat> recorders in a bag on top of the filaments, and then right over here we slid it under the filament, let it run for a day. Here I plotted the night in gray, and you can see the sort of die yield at this 24-hour cycle you'd expect at night oxygen levels drop. But for the one under the under the mat, it looks like it was broken. And when we expand the scale, maybe not we still see the die yield cycle. The maximum concentration is only 0.2. The bugs we find down there are all adapted to a life with very little oxygen, and that's not very good trout food. So what we're thinking at this point is, the river is functioning in a way that nitrogen is limiting the growth of the algae. We know it's phosphorus rich. We know it gets very warm under base low conditions. So as the algae grows, it pulls down the nitrogen. It creates a large algal standing stock. And that algal standing stock creates highly oxygenated conditions in the water column. And that is where the state agencies measure the dissolved oxygen concentrations to determine stress. If we look closer at the bottom of the river system, in what we call a subalgal zone, there's a zone down here in the bottom habitat that becomes anoxic. And we know that because when you step out there, besides the oxygen numbers, when you step out there, you get a cloud of black organic matter akin to the sap propel that develops in the oceans, partially decomposed, probably sulfur rich. We don't, we don't know that yet. But under those conditions, copper can be highly mobilized. And I don't mean wash away, I mean get be in a form that can be incorporated into the food web. And the invertebrates show a very high body burden. One of my students is looking at the association of invertebrates with this subalgal zone and what that means for growth and metal content of the invertebrates. It's just not a good place for trout food. And it may be that the fisheries is struggling with uh, food limitations. We don't know. We're in the process of collecting the data to, to look at abundance. So the take home model for Reach C is that this, this nitrogen coming in here is growing the cloth. The cladophora, under, either, either under decomposition or at night, removes the oxygen, liberates copper that gets into the bugs and ultimately messes with the food web. So then the ultimate question is, where does the nitrogen come from? I mean, why is there so much nitrogen on the landscape? If you look at this reach, you can see perhaps one potential source. That's alfalfa right there. Oh, I was going to say, remember all loads in one and two. So that's right in here. So if most of the nitrogen is where it's coming from, it's coming in right here. So it might be in fixation associated with alfalfa, but man, that's a lot of nitrogen to get from those fields. I got a colleague with the Clark Fork Coalition. He says it's cows. I haven't explained to him yet that cows don't fix nitrogen. They can concentrate it, but they can't create new nitrogen. So I went to the Department of Environmental Quality and said, where do you think all this nitrogen coming from? And they said, ANFO. And I said, An ANFO, INFO, that's why I'm here. He said, no, no, ANFO. I had no idea what ANFO is. And then I turned on the TV. And as it turns out, ANFO is ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. That's what they switched to in the 60s. They used to use TNT. Now they use that, and they use this guy as their major explosive. So I turned on the TV. And you guys watch Anthony Bourdain. You know this guy's story? He's a recovering addict. He's a world-class chef, and he goes around all over these places and drinks huge amounts of alcohol and, and samples their food. It's a great program. <laughs> 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 He's in Butte. 
He's induced down in the mines with the um, seniors from Montana Tech. The only functioning mine in Butte, underground mine, is for teaching. And they, they create what are called rounds, 20 to 30 explosions in a circle, that once they discharge it, they collapse part of the, the, the tunnel shaft, and that's what they mine. But when they did this explosion, it didn't create anything like this. It was about a foot deep. So there are almost 5,000 miles of underground horizontal passages. Every six inches is 20 to 30 explosions. I talk to my colleagues who work in the um, Superfund sites from Seattle. They go, oh, everybody knows the nitrogen in Butte came from the, from the powder, from the explosions. And where is that written down? <laughs> Show me the data. Well, everybody knows it. Well, if everybody knows it, then Butte should have been arguing strongly for remediation to include nutrient removal. And they should have paid for that. So how do we find out? Because if, if it's coming from Butte's underground passageways, you're, you're not going to remove it. But if it's coming from riverine, you know, floodplain environments, maybe you could change land practices. So we're going after the 18-0, um, 15-N approach. There's a paper that shows that these explosives are enriched in 18 up. So Mark set up the sampling system. We've done four seasons. We're going to go to the um, Bureau of Mining and Geology and get some groundwater from under Butte's Convention Center. There's so much copper, the water is actually blue. I don't know how we'll get, because this has to get processed through the denitrifying bugs, and I'm not sure you can give them that much copper. So we have some challenges. But, but hopefully we'll get an opportunity to think about this in the future so that we can get a chance to link Clark Park's past to some different set of futures that have alternative utility. For instance, the old course, the old works course in Anaconda, any golfers in here, you should go there. And then opportunities for education and interaction with the public. Thanks very much. Questions? Tim. So the copper story, food chain. Um, how much how much copper can a regular rainbow trout tolerate in its diet? I don't know. I mean, what they do is they calculate the what's called the body burden, milligrams of metal in per gram of body tissue. What they're doing is they cage these trout. And they distribute them all along the Clark Fork. They feed the, the trout in the cage, and then they look at mortality and fit a uh, what's that kind of regression that does like sigmoidal logistic. That's it. Use a logistic regression to try to figure out is there a body burden that suggests mortality, and they get it to fit, but they get a huge number of outliers. And so they're like, well, it's not just copper alone. Copper cove areas with a bunch of other things in the stream, like pH. So they're working on it. Um, and we're using stable isotopes of the fish biomass that they're using to try to figure out if, in fact, they're eating the stuff they're feeding them. Because the cages aren't, they, they could be designed differently, I think. I was the impression that the, one of the big fish kills derives, the big fish kills derives from the copper that's, that's when you have a flood event, it releases this big flush of copper, soluble copper, and that interacts with the gills. Right. So right. there are two, two measures of copper availability. One is total recoverable. That's what you draw from the sediment versus dissolved copper. And the, the, the condition you're describing was before they restored the headwaters, both Silver Bow and Warm Springs Creek, those floodplains, when they would inundate, they would mobilize absurd anoptic metal laden mass fish death. That hasn't happened for some time. They restored uh, Silver Bow over the last couple decades. So the fish kills now are far less frequent and sort of chronic rather than episodic. Um, primarily because those. Those flood systems, the, the flood, one thing I did not mention is when those two small streams come together, they, there's a big pond system called the Warm Stream Ponds used to settle particulate, but also chopping off the hydrograph and flattening it out so you don't get as big a flood pulse below it.
Are there um, are there analog systems to the north, maybe, where you don't see Cladophora blooms? I mean, it seems like Cladophora isn't just a response to enrichment. It seems like they're in pristine systems as well and can be pretty productive. But Yeah, that's a good question. I know that Walter Dodds did a survey of river systems in Montana to figure out are there things that would predict Cladophora abundance. One of them was flow, another one was temperature, and total nitrogen did an okay job. So I think that you're right. I think there's a lot more going on. It, it regenerates from these basal cells that are, when you look at them, they look like a, almost like a varnish, and it explodes back. So if you have a, a, a scouring flood, you'll not cut off the back. So it might be a combination of the stability of the system because of the lack of the flood pulse uh, with nutrient abundance. I, I think you're right. I think there are going to be multiple factors determining the abundance. So that's up the Blackfoot. Is that <clears throat> What's that? The location of this of those streams is like up the Blackfoot. Right, what you might use for references, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. Uh, the, the state uses the Bitterroot, a, a, re, a reach on the Bitterroot and a reach on the Blackfoot. Mm -hmm. Which is good in some ways, in other ways it's really bad. The chemistry of the Blackfoot is completely different. It, it's hardness and it's just a different beast. But question here? Uh, I know you mentioned that there's not much you can do if the nutrient source ends up being the, the butte explosions. Um, but I'm wondering, in a creative sense, is there a way that restoration efforts would change given that as the new source, or are there other best practices, other places where people have found that to be the source that have done restoration? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but one of the things that sort of makes this, well, makes it intriguing, is that that first station where we started doing the monitoring of the loads, what the VNRP did years ago, is below the confluence of the two streams that drain Butte and Anaconda. So if the nitrogen is coming from Butte and Anaconda, it ought to be present at that mm -hmm. site. But the load goes up hugely between one and two, which is why I kind of drew that, like maybe it's going around that first station. It is actually, so we don't know. I'm gonna there's some hydrogeology going on there. If it turns out that it's not blast nitrogen, then that reach between Warm Springs and Deer Log, there's a lot going on there. And Deer Log's sewage treatment is, is um, given into the second reach, the reach that consumes nitrogen, consumes the sewage treatment as well. So there's clearly, I think it's Clodophora, frankly, but we don't know what's actually consuming the nitrogen. And then we don't know, like I said, where it comes from. So it, I suspect that if we can convince the state that all this nitrogen is pouring into the river because of the mines, they'll have to look to what now. Okay. All right. Well, thanks very much. Thank you.